Hey there. Hey, this is Paul Hansen. Uh, and I played this instrument, a bassoon, jazz bassoonist. I don't know, electric jazz bassoonist, electric bassoonist, jazz bassoonist, bassoonist, uh, various different musics. One thing for sure, I never find myself being uh, a purist, uh, for sure. Do all kinds of different stuff. I play classical music, I played contemporary classical music, I played, uh, uh, I don't know, or hip hop tracks, I've done all kinds of different things. Uh, I do recording, you know, I've, I've been lucky to work with a lot of people over the years, such as Billy Cobham, uh, Crossman's Project, uh, Bell Fleck and the Fleck Tones, uh, Cirque du Soleil, uh, a number of different jazz artists, Jonas Helberg, Peter Erskine, um, a bunch of different people. I mean, a lot of things I've done have been a few, you know, short engagements and some things have been longer. I'd say my longest engagements have been with uh, Billy, Billy Cobham and with the Fleck Tones uh, and Bella Fleck. Um, then I'm known as that bassoon guy, I guess, or the guy who plays that weird instrument called the Uba or something like that. Uh, so I've had a lot of uh, interesting times with this instrument. I'm also a saxophonist. You might see a saxophone back, uh, saxophone back there too. Uh, also started as a saxophone player. So I started playing music in Berkeley, uh, in Ber not in Berkeley High School, but the Berkeley uh, school district, Berkeley Unified School District uh, music program in the 70s, kind of a, a great thing that was started by uh, Phil Hardiman, Dick Whittington, and, and Herb, Dr. Herb Wong. Uh, so I had contemporaries such as Peter Applebaum, uh, Stephen Bernstein, uh, Herb Sneed, Benny Green. We all went to school together. Uh, Joshua Redman, um, I was a little bit younger than me. I knew of him, Dave Ellis, um, a number of different people, Will Bernard. Anyway, so I kind of got my start in that, and I started first on clarinet, then we played saxophone, and then I wanted a more of a classical uh, instrument to play in, in orchestras and stuff. So I uh, started playing bassoon and uh, took lessons, got good, uh, won a competition when I was in high school, and uh, a person who had heard me there, who judged in that competition, was Stephen Paulson, who was the principal bassoonist of San Francisco Symphony, he still is. And uh, it led to me end up going to school. After one year in New England Conservatory, I went to finish my my bachelor's degree, the only degree I really have uh, in classical bassoon performance. So I really learned the instrument the way you know you're supposed to learn it, which I really you know value very much. And ironically, we're we're not ironically. Uh, it's interesting because now it's just music. It's not so separated as you know jazzers or classical musicians or whatever it's you know, more and more people doing everything and i really like that because music is music right and um but you have to you know have your training and i also got my training as a sax player by doing gigs and playing with people and you know doing the same way everybody does in the jazz world where you get up and play with some people sometimes you don't do well so you you know, have to go back to the woodshed you know all that kind of stuff and i did that as a session player and as a um bassoonist as well and that's much more weirder because people have no idea what this this thing is and what the heck is this thing you're bringing on the stage you know uh what is it you know and you get this you know microphone attached to it and good god what's going on it takes a lot of um courage and stubbornness to keep going on those kind of things so anyway that's uh how i kind of got to the point where uh, i was working with a lot of people in the bay area uh musicians you know, such as Peter Applebaum, such as uh, a guy named Joel Harrison, a guitarist who lives in New York now. Um, so I played with you know, a bunch of different people. And there was a nice, you know, 90s scene. Uh, some of the, I guess the back then, what, what was it called? Uh, the uh, acid jazz scene a little bit. Uh, you know, I was on the fringes of that. Uh, but um, a person who really helped me get to where I got, I wouldn't be here without him was a human being, a beautiful, beautiful person named Paul McCandless, oboist and saxophone player with the group Oregon. And a lot of people do not know about the group Oregon, but you really should hear Oregon. Um, and Ralph Towner, Paul McCandless, um, and a couple of different uh, rhythm sections they've had over the years, but those two are the main people who've been there the longest. I think it's uh, Mark Walker's played drums since, uh, I don't know when, 90s. Um, and the bass players change, and I'm just spacing on. Glenn Moore was the original bass player, Glenn Moore. Anyway, Paul McCandless uh, had heard me play on a recording I'd made um, 
back in the 90s and a guitarist on the recording was a wonderful guitarist in New York named Steve Cardenas. And Steve Cardenas gave Paul McCandless a listen to this and he heard me. And so Paul McCandless heard me as a oboist hearing a bassoon player in jazz and things led to another and he invited me uh, and he got me hooked up with the International Reed Society, International Double Reed, excuse me, International Double Reed Society. And from there, I got hooked up with that world, which was mainly just a conference of double reed players, oboists, uh, bassoonists, mainly classical, but they were intrigued by the jazz aspects. So that kind of connected me to some very interesting, you know, wonderful people in that world. And he also had me sit in with the band he was touring with at the time called Bell Fleck and the Flectons. And one thing led to another, and I ended up recording with the band in 2000 and then touring with the band. And uh, we did two records that I was on called, one was called Outbound and one was called Live at the Quick. And that's a live record and um, really fantastic uh, experience. Now, what I think is very interesting for a lot of people, I'm going about this in an interesting kind of, you know, improvisatory way the way I'm talking, but what was very interesting to me, what I've learned about that experience is that, you know, you take a strange instrument that, you know, people say you're not supposed to be able to play on, you know, you're not, what is that? You should, you know, you, you're supposed to be a saxophone player or, and jazz and, and uh, pop and rock and funk and, you know, whatever it's all. And bassoon player in classical music. Uh, so you get over all that stuff. You get to one position where you really feel like you have it. You have a great situation. That's fantastic when you are a unique instrumentalist. So you're, you know, there's not many of you that you do that. And I want more people. I want more bassoonists to play music that has improvisation and, you know, different things. And that's fantastic. So it's very interesting to me. What I learned out of that is that you can't in music ever have it made. You always have to keep making it. So my adjustment was that's a great, fantastic experience back, you know, 20 years ago or so. And then once that's over, what are you going to do with it afterwards? So that's the thing. It's always like you have to you know, be good in business. You have to figure out a way how to market yourself. You have to find a way, find a way to be valuable as a musician for other people to want to work with you. You know, you don't want to be just, you know. Uh, like kind of funny, like the COVID thing, but in your in your studio by yourself, and the, it's all about integration with other people for live music, and you know, bringing something to make something greater than yourself. So uh, I learned some lessons from that. That was fantastic. High. It was fantastic. It was great. And things after that weren't so so fantastic. Weren't so bad either. It's just that you know, it's not like a, there's a blueprint, right? It's not like a end up with one person, you work with another person because they need someone on the like instrument. There's not. Uh, you know, there's orchestral positions for bassoonists and not like jazz bands with bassoon positions, for example. So uh, I hope that changes at some point. And I really like the fact that there's more so-called classical and jazz, you know, integration and mixing going on right now. There's some really unique times, I think, right now. So uh, music is in fantastic shape. It's very hard to make a living as always, but music is in fantastic shape. It's great music now. So that's uh, one of the biggest lessons I ever learned is that you just always kind of keep going and you never, you know, shouldn't say it's too satisfied, you know, and uh, just keep working and keep, you know, you know, look for the next thing to do. You know, be, you know, happy with what you're doing, but you know, there's always the next day uh, something comes after that. So um, that's what I learned about that experience because at one point, you know, when I was just putting my taking my bassoon to New England Conservatory and putting a microphone down it and here and playing through a, an amplifier with a rock guitar setting and just making snarling noises. You know, I really wanted to do something with the thing, but it was just so out of left field. It's like, what the heck, you know? And I, anything, I did not want to be out of left field. I wanted to be legitimate and sound good and be really, really be something, you know, something unique, uh, but we're good. And so a lot of things have worked out for me way more. I mean, I don't know if they more way more than I thought they would, but, uh, you know, you, you just keep going. You just might be, you know, it just might all work out, you know? So that's, I've been very lucky and very blessed to have great situations with, you know, people like, you know, uh, the guys in Billy Cobham's band and, and working with them and different things I've done in the past. Like uh, my my time with Search and Slay was very interesting because uh, they were looking for a unique woodwind instrumentalist who can play all different kinds of music styles. And um, I auditioned for them in L.A. in the mid 2000s. And I happened to have my saxophone in the car. And so I also uh, did, you know, what I've done a lot of playing a lot of R&B and jazz saxophone like you do in the, in the Bay Area. You're going to play a lot of 
funk gigs and things like that, you know, if you grow up here. Um, and so, yeah, brought it, no problem. I do that all the time. So I did that and it led to me doing one show in South America for all 2006, where I ended up playing bassoon as part of the show. They would have a MIDI part, like a phony bassoon part in this particular part of the show. And now they had a real bassoonist to play it. So in addition to all the other instruments I played, uh, I would be playing uh, bassoon. So I played bassoon in that show, but the thing they had really in store for me was um, the show called Zed, which opened in 2008 in Tokyo. And I lived in Tokyo for four years uh, and a marvelous time with that incredible show that most people in, in the West have never seen. It was just an amazing show. And uh, it was very incredible. It was 380 shows a year, uh, but there was improvisation involved. And you know, all those shows was relatively the same pretty much every time. You had to be able to improvise because when the people you're working with were acrobats, amazing gymnastics, uh, Olympic gymnasts doing amazing things. Something might be a little different with their, their move that day. Or they need more time to take something or something might go wrong technically with the lighting or whatever. You have to be able to improvise. You have to keep the show going. So you just can't sit there and do nothing. So you have to be able to improvise in the style. And that was a fantastic gig for me. And uh, while I was in Japan, of course, with my family, we were raising our two uh, kids, my, my wife and I, you know, we moved from the United States to Japan for those years. Um, you know, during my time there, I didn't have too much time off, but I did get a chance to play in the Tokyo music scene a little bit and play clubs like uh, Nakamura, Nakamura, there's a place called the New Rakuya Club, where uh, I used to play with uh, a number of different people. Um, and it was real fun doing stuff when you're just doing for the music and you had some great spinner on kind of things, you know, I'll play with DJ one day, I think I played with a, uh, a painter a couple of times, a great painter named Tom Reyes. Uh, he's a very big jazz uh, fan, and he used to work for the Tokyo Blue Note. Tom Reyes, if he's out there, hello, how you doing? Um, those are some great gigs. Uh, so anyway, um, that's kind of been my career. So, you know, professionally big things happened, I guess, in uh, 2000 with Bell and the Flectos, then a period in Cirque du Soleil, and then we moved back here and slow been working with people. Another musician I've worked with that I really loved is uh, Jeff Denson. There's an album called Concentric Circles out uh, with him. That's fantastic. And uh, he's a bassist who has worked with Lee Connitz until he passed away. Uh, he lives in the Bay Area, but he's from uh, D.C. originally. and used to be in the New York scene a little bit. Um, and so um, now uh, I guess I'll look at some of the questions that um, have come up here. How I got into jazz. Who was the first musician you remembered? Oh my gosh. Well, the, I do know that I listened a little bit to Cannibal Adderley really early on uh, in my f f first time I went on buy records and see what they're about, you know, LP records back in the 70s. But the guys that really hit me over the head were John Coltrane, uh, should be some late John Coltrane, like from Transition, the record called Transition Onward, uh, Transition, and then from that period on, which was like mid 65, I guess, uh, right before he would go what they call out. Just incredible, soulful. I mean, you know, Love Supreme and amazing stuff. Just, you know, it just it hits you here. It's not even a thing you like them because, oh, they play these nice, you know, chordal patterns, whatever. It's just a soul. And it's like, oh, my God, river of soul. Just incredible. You know, it gets you right here. Him and then, of course, McCoy Tyner, uh, some of McCoy Tyner's record like Atlantis, Fly With The Wind, uh, Focal Points. Uh, that really killed me. And... Um, those are the first, you know, those are the first uh, things that really hit me. Uh, uh, in terms of the advice from older musicians, it's kind of what it just happened, what I said earlier. It's like, you always got to keep making it, you know. And when I talk to, uh, you know, people that call mentors like people like Billy Cobham and stuff, hearing about his days with some legendary musicians that he's played with, uh, musicians <laughs> kind of sound the same. They have the same kind of idiosyncrasies and different, kind of interesting, funny habits on the road and stuff like that. And these are guys that are legends. It's incredible. You know, it's always been kind of summer, summer, but, you know, just uh, keep working and um, you know, try to leave a good path behind you and don't burn any bridges. You know, all that kind of stuff is really important. You know, uh, how am I coping with the pandemic? Uh, the pandemic has been very tough uh, on certain family members in our family, some you know, our, our, you know young ones. Uh, when you're, I can't imagine going to high school and not by go, not going to high school and sitting in my room on a computer. I just can't imagine it. So having a year of that, thank God that's done. 
and things are looking up. So it's really tough. It's a big transition because I was very busy uh, up to that point and looking forward to some really unique, you know, nice projects with some different people. I'll mention some of the things I'm doing a little bit later. But, um, you know, it's just kill. It's, everything stopped, you know. All the touring stopped. I was going to tour with uh, uh, Billy. Uh, and the guys in Billy's band are amazing musicians. Freed Hawking, guitar, just the most incredible guitar player. Amazing. Uh, fantastic. Well-versed uh, guitar player. Uh, you know, Tim Landers on bass and uh, Scott Tibbs on keyboards. And just, just a fantastic group. And um, we were going to tour Japan and China. And I really wanted to get back to Japan because I haven't seen my friends in Japan in a long time. And well, that went by the wayside when COVID hit. And I had some other things that I was able to do last year, late last year, that I was actually able to schedule and do that were, uh, you know, that, that happened. So I was able to get some touring in between when the pandemic started and now at this point in time, because we had a little period there in the fall of 2021 where I was able to get out and go to Europe uh, with a guy named Vincent Hudike, uh, which I, somewhere on my website, I, I used to be a schedule, I can post something about him. He's a musician who is a, a great uh, vibes player from uh, the Netherlands. And I was also did a residence, residency at University of North Carolina School of the Arts as a guest of Saxon Rose, the person was there, and it was a really fantastic event. Um, so, I'm probably, you know, like I always am, I'm going between topics, but uh, the pandemic has been tough, of course, for everybody. Uh, I do have an Ethernet cable and a little studio in my uh, property, and uh, so uh, I'm able to teach from here. And at one point, it felt, oh, that's great. I can save so much money from driving everywhere by staying here and teaching. Well, yeah, you can, but there's nothing like being next to a person and seeing their fingers and we get to play with them in time without the delay and stuff like that. So uh, it's, you know, it's tough, you know. I was able to, to keep in touch with all my students and, and to some, teach students, of course, wherever they are. There happen to be some in Europe or some in um, uh you know, north here in different states, other parts of the country. I have a student in, from Hawaii right now. So that's cool, but I do like seeing people in, in real life, of course, too. So that's been hard. Uh, but, you know, we just in certain ways to it. Um, what has been interesting about where we are in terms of media and how we listen to music and how everything is done is, you know, we get to everything. There's so much social media, and I'm on some social media bunch, um, Instagram. Facebook uh, and and YouTube are using my music stuff. I'm more of a basketball fan on Twitter, so I'm a big Golden State Warriors fan. So that's usually what I use Twitter for, not so much music. Uh, so, um, but um, so you know, people notice videos. They notice things that you can they post a little video of my student. I can make it sound really good because I'm right here. I can control the whole narrative because I do have a little recording studio here, and mainly I use it for recording my sound. You know, my tracks. And I've worked with uh, different, you know, people since I had the studio before the pandemic and through the through by, you know, they want me to play on the record. So they send me a, you know, stem to play over and I'll make, you know, play over and record it, you know, save the stems and, you know, and uh, we transfer it to somebody. So I've do, done that a bunch. And that's kind of cool when you can, because it saves you from driving. You just work on the project and kind of command your sound the way you hear yourself and with your educated, you know, as your understanding of your sound and what you want to do, you can really be in control of it if you learn, you know, your studio environment, which I have to a certain degree, not as much as some, but definitely enough to get by recording a solo or some parts for some people. And I've done that a bunch since the pandemic started for sure, because, you know, people still want to put out music and still want things. So, and then, you know, it's very interesting having social media because um, it did lead to definitely opportunities by people hearing me and hearing what I do and, um, I just, you know, like we all want, we want to get back to the point where we're playing live music with other people in beautiful venues in all kinds of different places. And that you have a great time at those venues and bring back that audience because it's really music when there's an audience. I mean, you can do it for yourself when fantastic, but the audience is really what it's about. It's a play for people, it's the unity of the, the groups together when they feel the room rise because great things are happening. Uh, and, you know, the spiritual moments. And it's kind of hard to do it from a, other side of a, uh, you know, mode of whatever. Um, so, you know, that's been interesting. So, okay. Uh, uh, any advice you want to give young musicians to keep them encouraged? Anything I just said, basically, just got to keep going. You might reach different plateaus and point that are fantastic. And then 
keep working to get to the next thing. You know, uh, we stay working. I'm fascinated by younger musicians today because, my God, it takes a lot of energy. You know, it takes so much energy, so much, you know, foresight in how you organize your career, how it kind of looks like and smells like on social media, how uh, you're about to promote yourself and have that hunger because you will at some point get a little tired of, you know, being yourself against the pavement if you don't see the results, you know. So, you know, I'm really, you know, there's so much great music out there and I'd love to see people making things happen and go for it, you know, go for it, go for it, go for it. Um, having that energy is really important. And then, you know, just also just uh, listen to other people, you know, uh, just try to be a good audience member when you can be, you know, it's not all about you, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think that's good. I know I might have more advice later, but that's basically what I, what I feel about it at the moment. Uh, any other darn thing? Uh, I'm not close. I got nine minutes left. So, um, um, yeah. So, you know, there was a great era for me in terms of, you know, my musicality. So I, first of all, in the seventies, I was around the Berkeley high kind of club and <clears throat> so beautiful classical music. I was also into, you know, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> um, also, you know, the whole jazz lexicon, there's a lot of different things to listen to. I started listening to rock and I thought I had listened to it before, but I really started getting into it when I got out of Berkeley for some reason, I got more into pop and rock and uh, guitar players, you know, Hendrix, different kind of things, uh, Van Halen to a certain degree, you know, different things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with me, quote, a jazz person, but, uh, Oh, someone's someone's talking. What's happening now? I don't know. Someone just came in. I don't think that's related to this, but uh, I'll just uh, uh, I'll get to that later. Um, so you know, like I just did a gig with Michael Mannering. Uh, people who know who Michael Mannering is, he's an amazing solo bassist who's done a lot of work with a lot of different people too. But uh, he kind of has his own creative sound. It's fantastic sound. He does a lot of amazing solo bass concerts kind of revolutionary on the instrument and uh worked here a lot in the kind of what it was called they call it this it's a horrible name for the new age music scene i'm talking about way long ago in the mid 80s to a little before that what didn't mean just like cocktail music just to kind of go to sleep to it's not definitely not that at all oh my his stuff is very deep and powerful and and uh, he has very different types of records a lot of different things so Michael Manring, uh, I just did a gig with him in uh, Arizona on the 29th of uh, January. Uh, there may be something on my social media about it. I don't know if we have, there may be a recording of somewhere about that comes out. And we may be ending up working together a little bit more with a drummer named Scott Amadola. And uh, so Scott Amadola is a drummer who is a Bay Area guy who worked with uh, all kinds of different musicians. I'm not going to list everybody, but uh, Charlie Hunter is one guy he's worked with a lot. Uh, there's a band called TJ Kirk, which I think is just, now being able to release some of their music again uh somehow i have to you know figure out what that is but we've been talking about playing together because when i played with michael i said well we should play this trio let's get this thing together so hopefully that'll happen uh that's one project uh uh i'm in another group uh and all these are things on my website that you'll see uh a guy a group called vitamin m so they spelled em vitamin em for emily onerdonk it's a uh, my only acoustic group right now that I play with, and we're doing some concerts this spring. There's one on May 1st. I think there's something else later. I've got to look at the dates, but there's links to my, them from my uh, website. And so it's a wonderful group where it's a very grooving, kind of groove music oriented acoustic string quartet with a bassoonist and a great accordion player. Uh, that's the one project I have. Uh, of course, I have a residency coming up at. Uh, just got fit, finalized recently at uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, I think it's called the Blair Center. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm a guest of Jared Hauser at the Oboist, the Oboe Professor at Vanderbilt Vanderbilt University, April 27th and 28th of this year. I'll be doing a solo concert, I think on the 27th and 28th, there'll be a clinic. Uh, there's some other big things that I can't talk about yet that I hope to be able to share. Um, potential Billy Cobham tour later this year, uh, which is, looks really good. Hopefully that happens. Um, and there's another wonderful group. Uh, there's a wonderful singer who uh, and a uh, husband duo, uh, they're named uh, Morea Dickinson and uh, Tariq Rabib. I hope I pronounced that right. But there's a group called Raise the Maze, R-A-Z-E, the M-A-Z-E, -E, Raise the Maze. They used to be part of a group called Motar and they're, I would say progressive rock but fantastic music. And I'm, 
I'm working with them a little bit. I did some recording with them, and uh, I hope the record's coming out relatively re relatively soon. I'll definitely put something out about it when I can. Um, fantastic, and I really it's really interesting for me because as a bassoon player, you wouldn't think it, but there's a lot of uh, similarities between the range of a, a guitar in some ways and a bassoon. Uh, I go a little lower than a guitar does, but and not quite as high, but you kind of fill a role of being almost like a, in the rhythm section kind of thing. You're right in the middle with the bassist, and you're and it's, you're you're not always soaring way above. Although I can play high, uh, I just love that use the bassoon as like a rhythm instrument or a, like a playing parts that feel like a guitar part or a synth part or something like that that really fit in a in a pop band kind of mentality or you know whatever you call it, progressive pop or what progressive rock, but just you know, not just the roles of normal quote horns, you know, or you know, pads as you know what uh, a woodwind player would play. So uh, I enjoy that. I'm trying to think of anything I've forgotten here. Uh, there's probably going to be somebody said you forgot to mention the group we're in. Um, yeah, I mean things are just kind of going to start to get going again. Uh, I was really hyped when I got back from Europe. I am trying to record a new album at some point. I really, really, really do, but I have to do some, yeah, thank you. Um, I have to do some fundraising, which I may be getting back to the world about at some point, but I do want to put on another record. I really do. It's time, you know, and I, <laughs> uh, but it just, you know, I'm trying to figure out how you release it. I, I, I need to answer, I need to ask questions about how Spotify works, for example. And I know that, you know, it doesn't pay you very much for streaming. It's basically a radio service, basically. It's back like radio. But some people made it work for them. And I don't know what the model is into these days. I can make a CD, but then no one has a CD player. So I don't know. So I have to figure that one out. But, uh, yeah, I am pretty much ha happy uh, with a lot of things these days. And I just want to keep my health in good shape. And I'm pretty much done, I think. I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do once I'm done. But, um I wish I thank you very much for being here. I know I've been talking and talking and talking and talking. So I like to be playing and playing and playing and uh, can't wait to be doing that more. And uh, I'm sure I will. So thank you very much. I'm going to figure out how to stop by emailing my host and ask her how do 